Hi everyone, this is your chess puzzler and welcome to the channel. If you're a chess fanatic, you would want to know many things, but do you know what Carlsen's first official game had been? Today, I want to cover his game against Courts, a game that was played back in the last October days of 2000. And this is what Carlsen looked like at the time. He was only 10 years old. And does time fly? For sure. What I have for you today is not his first game and I will be releasing another Carlsen game shortly to cover what seems to have been his first ever game because he was already active when this game was played against courts. Anyhow, this is what I want to cover. So let's just treat this one as one of his earliest games. Carlsen at the time was quite weak. But the more he played, the better he became. He was like an artificial intelligence, and this is no exaggeration. Since the game does require memory, and plenty of it, Carlson was very good at memorising things at a very young age. Let's see how this game went. Carlson White went for a D4 opening, and now through Knight of 6 and C4, Courts got in to play the Benoni. With knight f3, the opening transposed into the English, two knights symmetrical. And now with takes and takes, courts went after the knight through e5. Carlsen repositioned his knight to b5. And now with d5, this game was beginning to open up. Carlsen here took, and rather than recapture, courts came up with this bishop move. And in turn, Carlsen was forced to back off his knight to overcome any unpleasant surprises with a possible move like queen to b6 for example. Courts castled and only now Carlsen closed up the gap on f2 and what does Courts do? He pushed on with e4 after h3 and rook e8 Carlsen went for g4 a very computer like response. Courts came up with this very unusual but very interesting idea. He lifted his rook to e5, adding the pressure on this guy. You really need to cover this guy, and there is one way to do this. Actually, there are a few ways to do this. Carlson activated his bishop. And now, you can see how important e5 is, in that plenty if not all resources are used to both defend and attack this square, depending, of course, on what side you play. Quartz wants to mount the pressure on d5 and came up with this intermediate knight move. And we know where this knight is destined next. It was our anticipation of the next move. Carlson knew exactly what Quartz was cooking and got his queen into support d5. And after this, he has nothing else to cover this guy. We would normally expect this knight to reroute to b6 to finally be able to remove d5, but miraculously courts bypasses. What he did was to reroute his knight back to base and is now looking to bring him into the game for this avenue, not c7 but d6 to go after this bishop. Carlsen here developed his knight and now when this knight landed on d6, he not only attacks the bishop but also supports his sky on e4. Being reluctant to give up his bishop for the knight, Carlsen repositioned him to e2 and just see how efficiently Quartz is in activating his own pieces. He went for this queen move setting off the alarm bells. I hope you can see what the idea is behind this queen initiative. First of all, Carlsen could not castle. And two, this guy on e3 is hanging. So what we have in place is a very cunning trap. If you allow e3 to come off, you are as good as having given up this game. Carlsen can protect by moving either knight. Moving the knight away from c3 is fine, and so is moving this knight away from d2. Carlsen here went for this knight move, forcing out the exchange and for the time being, 
E3 is no longer in danger. Though this trap didn't work for courts, he came up with something else. And right now, you have two options. You can either sit back and wait for me to show you what courts came up with, or you can try and fish out. And why not? I'll give you this option. Let's try this anyway, so here we go in two, one, and pause. What do you think of B5 gambiting this guy? This is some tremendous push. Carlson saw nothing wrong if he took, and this is what he did. He took with the queen, and this went right and according to what courts had planned. What's a better way to activate your otherwise lame rook by going after the queen? So Quartz is using his knight on d7, not only to cover this bishop, but now the rook too. We know the queen needs to evacuate this file, and we also know this rook is here to stay, taking now full control of this file. After the queen went into hiding, Quartz repositioned his knight to f6, and here Carlson goes for this very interesting response. And he won queen to c6. And what a spot to place her on. And what on earth is cause to do here? Do you move your bishop out of danger? Or do you go for something else? Which is obviously less visible. Do you want to think this one over? We know the chance of checkmating the black king is as low as zero. Because black can always return his bishop to f8. And also he has the knight to cover e8. And this rook too. An interesting thing to look out for is whether the queen can somehow squeeze into this spot, forking the rooks. But even if this happens, black is still covered by getting his knight back into d7. With the threat this queen has, courts return the knight to d7 and just note how many pieces are needed, only to be in a position to keep this queen at bay. Carlson never abandoned his plan of trying to invade into c7, and pushed on with d6. The position is slightly complicated because you do need to keep your eyes open, not only at this quadrant here, but across the entire board. Having repositioned the knight from f6 to d7 no longer allows white to sneak into c7 and then into d8 because his lady guards d8 and two, the knight can always return to f8. But, there seems to be a problem with Carlsen's previous move. How well executed was d6? Not, because Quartz went for this rook move, and now it seems this guy in d6 has reached the end of the road. And yet things turn nasty when Carlsen, or better his knight, removed d4. Because, not only e4 is now gone, but now this knight is looking to remove this bishop too. So everything, or nearly everything, depends on the next few moves. I need to take us how and what courts went for in two, one, and pause. Bishop b7, and what a move. Carlson is left with a very limited number of options. He can either take the knight, or he can back off the queen to a4, and keep his own knight on a4 alive. But given this knight is also attacked by the rook, I'm not sure Carlsen had any option really. So after he arrested this knight, Quartz was about to strike back and has two pieces at his disposal to take him. He used the bishop to do the job and now this rook on h1 is also in danger. But this position is slightly deeper than you think. This is not just about the rook, but with the elimination of the knight on e4, d6 is also about to fall, but first things first, to prevent the catastrophe on h3, Carlson moved his rook into h2, and now when d6 came flying off, this rook on h2 has nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. He's a sitting duck, so let's turn him into one. This rook, or duck if you like, can now be written off so there is not even a need to move him anywhere. And yet Carlsen being Carlsen, even at this very young age, finds a very sound response. This is what you call an eye for an eye. If the bishop takes his rook, 
This bishop on c4 can also grab this rook. And the damage on the white pieces is somewhat reduced. But there is a huge difference between the two sides. This rook here on e6 can easily escape, but this rook on h2 can't. So to make things a bit more realistic, this bishop is the real cannon, so let's turn him into one. With courts to move, he can go for anything. He can get the rook out to g6, or even better, to f6, which prevents the taking on f7. But maybe after all, there is a far better move here, and certainly courts went for it. Do you possibly want to try it in two? One, and pause. What you're looking for is rook d8. Nothing better to go for. Carlson removed a7, and after this rook on h2 was gunned down, the same happened to this rook on e6, and of course, the immediate recapture of this bishop. Carlson is not only a piece down, but maybe, just maybe, he has something to play for after all. Mind you, many would prefer all these guys to the three black has, but white has another problem. Not only h3 can't be safe, but look at how bad this bishop is, and also this rook. Not even a miracle can save white. And again, it wouldn't be Carlson if he didn't have something to go for. He went for this queen move, threatening e6. But it would be anyone's guess what happens next. In fact, court did afford Carlson the opportunity to remove e6 with a check, but not before he got his bishop into this very key square. And this is what you can expect. After queen takes e6 with a check and king h8, white has no more checks. But Carlson has a far more serious problem right now, because this rook only needs to come into d1, and this game is over. And this will be a type of Morphe execution because he was a specialist in such type of finishes. But let's come back to see what happened here. What really happened here. After bishop d2 to stop the mate, the queen grabbed h3. And now Carlsen took e6 with a check. And after the king moved into the corner, Carlsen still went for it through this queen move. But all courts needs is to run with this rook and all the problems he has disappear. This rook can in fact move in either direction, horizontally of course. So guys, where did courts place his rook? He didn't. So forget I mentioned it in the first place. Though a bit hard to believe, courts found even a better move than move his rook out. Is there anything in this position to justify going for something else. And if so, do you want to have a go at this in two, one, and pause? Indeed, there is one move that does the trick, and this is it. It looks a bit hard, but in fact is a very easy one. Bishop to c7. Not only protecting the rook, but also allowing now the queen on h3 to sneak into h1. And this is all she wrote for white. So the bishop is off it for the game. And that sounds like a good deal to me. This bishop move was so powerful that forced Magnus to resign instantly. If the bishop is captured, white is looking at a mating one, but he would never get the chance. The very best white has is to prevent the mate in one. And if you wonder how, this is it. Queen h4. But after the queen goes, the mate is now unstoppable, and now you begin to see how strategically placed this bishop is placed on f3, because he ensures the king goes nowhere. So it's again a combi between these two pieces, and that is all black needs. Whatever white does, this game is over. The alternative to taking this bishop is to take the rook with a check, and when the queen is recaptured, we still have a very similar ending, but now without the queen and the rook. The difference is this. White is only able to prevent the mate, because after the bishop here vacates this square, 
we no longer have a mate in one, but a mate in something like maybe seven or eight moves. After this queen check and king d2, the rook falls, the queen can return to d1, and from here I can leave the rest to your imagination. There is nothing that can go wrong for black. But there is something else to this game. Just compare this Carlsen game to that against Rangelovic. Okay, Magnus lost both games and with the white pieces. But I can't help think of Carlsen resembling this creature in a good way, of course. So what is the connection between Carlsen and this frog? Well, let me show you this and I hope you can see for yourself. And this is it. Just like this frog, Carlsen too made a tremendous leap from one year to the other. During this game, Carlsen Zillo was low, but two years later, he moved into the 2120 range. Then by 2003, he achieved a 2450 rating, and by 2017, he had passed the 2700 barrier. And soon after, he became a super GM. In short, one joint leap after another. So again, this game we saw today is in fact a rare occurrence, but it had to start from somewhere. But I've got to admit, this was a beautiful game by Courts, a player who you rarely see today. According to what I have on Courts, he's currently ELO'd at 2255, but not at the time of this game. Before I let you go, we need to understand one thing. Back in 2000, the life of any chess player was so different when compared nowadays. With the proliferation of technology, coupled with the development of chess software, powerful chess software, think about how more powerful players are today. You hardly ever see any good players to take the wrong turn in the opening, because these are very easily testable. You can run them through an engine as simply as that. Okie dokie, hope you enjoyed it as much as I did making the video. In fact, this video was prepared a long time ago, and I only unearthed it very recently, hidden somewhere on my hard drive. So what I did was to add the new intro, and here we are. Plenty of more stuff to follow shortly, so until next time, this was your Chess Puzzler.